we will start for today and, and get going with our program. So first of all, um, for anyone who is watching this today or is will be watching it in our archive version, my name is Christine Staley. I am the Executive Director of Dyslexia Canada, and I'm very happy and proud to, to be presenting another webinar uh, for our parents, caregivers, and teachers right across Canada called Reading Aloud and Phonological Awareness. I'm very excited again to be presenting this because we get a lot of questions from parents, caregivers, and teachers on the best way or the most effective way to help our children at home and outside of the classroom environment. And I'm proud to welcome our speaker today, Dr. Sandra Jack Malik, who will be providing this presentation. Sandra is a director on the board of Dyslexia Canada and a very passionate and engaged volunteer. And it's been an absolute pleasure having her on the board of Dyslexia Canada. Sandra is a professor in the Department of Education at Cape Breton University, where she teaches language art, lang English language arts and curriculum studies courses. She's also a director for Society of uh, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Nova Scotians. So just before we dig in, um, just to let those who are on the line know that you are welcome to ask questions as we go along. So feel free to type those questions into the chat or the Q&A that you'll find at the bottom of your screen and Sandra will be answering those as we, as we go along. If there's anything that you ask that perhaps Sandra can't answer at the moment, we will make sure that we get back to you after the program is over. And then one last little announcement is we are recording this program. So it will be put up on our website uh, for viewing after the program is over. So with that, I will hand it over to Sandra. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to my colleague, Dr. Rob Power, who helped us with the technology. Uh, Rob's a colleague of mine at Cape Breton University. I wanna begin by acknowledging in Cape Breton where Rob and I are and um, this is in Unamagi, the, ancest the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, so today we're going to talk about reading aloud and phonological awareness. This is a very engaging topic as we come into school closure and summer recess and parents being concerned, parents, guardians, caregivers being concerned, uh, children will lose some ground over the summer. What I'd like to do today is a quick review again about this idea of phonological awareness and then give some strategies, some activities that you can do with um, you know, young children and, and children that are grades three, four, and five along there too. So um, thank you for having me, Dyslexia Canada and Christine. And if we could move to the second slide, that would be terrific. Okay. Um, I just have a little question here. Maybe if I minimize that, there we go. Okay, so this, the big, if you think about an umbrella, and I purposely picked this one because it shows the individual sections. Oftentimes we get confusion between phonemic awareness and phonological awareness. And if you think about phonological awareness as the whole entire umbrella, and each of the individual sections of the umbrella is a subskill of that makeup. When, when put together, like when all those colored bits of fabric are sewn together, they make an umbrella. When all these subskills are, are braided together, we get phonological awareness and we usually get a youngster who's, who's able to read. Um, so some of those subskills are identifying and manipulating our spoken speech, words, syllables, onsets, rhymes, rhyming, alliteration, intonation. These are all subskills of the big umbrella phonological awareness. These words that are bolded, I think that parents, guardians, caregivers, these are words, if your youngster is struggling, these are words that you want to familiarize yourself with. If when you go to a parent conference, a teacher conference, if, and your youngster is struggling, if you're not hearing these words, 
that's a little red flag. These are words that you, once you know them, that you can start using. And a little tip to help remember them, think of phono, think about a phone, and that's hearing, the hearing. Um, so phonemic awareness is, is the ability then to hear, English has approximately 44 sounds, and phonemic awareness, one of these sub skills of the bigger overall umbrella of phonological awareness, is the ability to think about, play with, hear the 44 different phonemes. A phoneme is the smallest unit of meaningful sound in a language. So for example, b, t, sh, those are all phonemes. The smallest unit of meaningful sound. If someone screams out, ah, that's not a phoneme, but because it's not a meaningful unit, it might be in a particular context, but we're thinking about the, the sounds that we push together to make words. And then grapheme, think about a graph, which is a picture. And that's the smallest part of written language. So in the book case, that's actually the letter B. Or in the t case, actually the letter T. And then syllables, this is another sub skill that your child needs to master as they become fluent readers. A group of letters with one vowel sound. So a syllable could be, for example, the word I. And you ask your youngster to give it three tests. Is it a group of letters? Yes. Then you might have to explain that a group can consist of one, a group of one. Does it have a vowel? Yes, it has I. And is there a vowel sound? Yes. If you look at the word feet, is it a group of letters? Check mark, yes. Does it have one vowel sound? Feet. And you ask the youngster, what is the vowel sound? And hopefully the child would say E. So it's a syllable also, and then cabin, uh, this is now a two syllable word because cab and in. Okay, then we, another sub skill, think of another one of these colored sections of the umbrella is this idea of rhyming. And these are words that sound the same, bat, cat, please, cheese. Words that sound the same. Another one of the sub skills. Blending is another sub, a sub skill. So when your child learns book, and when your child learns all, at some point, they're going to have to be able to blend those, push those two sounds together and say bull, or push S, P, and L together and say spool. So while they're instructed separately, there's going to come a time when the youngster needs to blend them together. Again, these are all sub skills under the big umbrella of phonological awareness. And when you think about it, as an umbrella and all the pieces that your youngster is weaving together as he or she or they move towards fluency, you'll see that it's very complex. And you'll see that there's a lot of skills that your youngster has to master in order to become a fluent reader. Christine, I can't see the chat. So if there's any questions, please feel free to interrupt and I will endeavor to answer them. Could we please move to the next slide? Another one skill that your youngster has to master is what we call phoneme. Remember, phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. Deletion. Delete means to take away. So, for example, in the word cat, what would you can say to your youngster? If with the word cat, if we remove the k sound, what would remain? And by your child answering at, your child's demonstrating that they, they can hear those three sounds and they can pull it apart. And most likely if they can pull it apart, they can put it back together. These pulling apart and putting together are skills that the youngster's gonna need when they're trying to figure out words, what they are on the page. And also when the child goes to start writing the words, they're gonna need those skills. Discrimination, another one of the sub skills. And this is the difference between words that sound similar and words that are different. They need to be able to do that. Oftentimes, an example of this is when a child learns their ABCs and they can sing the song and the parents are quite happy with the youngster able to do that. And then when you get to L and you ask the child, what is that? The child will say elemental P. So they haven't discriminated that it's L, M, N, 
O P for the youngster at that point in their development, it's elemental P. So this idea of discriminating, again, it's hearing and being able to take apart and knowing that there are similar sounds and different sounds. Another skill that a child needs to learn is this idea of segmentation. So for example, breaking words into syllables, so cabin, um, breaking words into, into word parts, for example, um, stop or stopping, so play, or unstoppable, so playing with bases and roots and prefixes and suffix. So as we continue to add on these subskills, you get this growing appreciation for the complexity of skills that a youngster has to learn. And the research is clear that about 30% of kids seem to be able to do this effortlessly. They just go to school and learn how to do it. Many kids go to school having learned how to do it. It's not unusual for youngsters to come to kindergarten. You know, it's not a, entirely common, but there are children who go to school already being able to read. Um, the last piece that is, is bedeviling for some children is phonetics. And this is where sometimes you need to engage a speech pathologist to help. And this is the articulation, the child's ability to articulate the 44 sounds that we make in English language. And this is using your tongue, your teeth, your throat, your lips, um, and your hard and soft palate, which is the roof of your mouth to produce the 44 sounds. If your child, if you are the, and you mentioned this last time, if you are the primary caregiver and you are the only one who can understand your child's four or four and a half or five, and you are the only one who can understand your, what your child's saying, then it's probably a very good idea to reach out to get some speech pathology support. They will intervene and they will give you, they will assess the youngster and they will give you some very concrete suggestions about how to teach um, and what activities to do with the child so that they can make themselves understood to everyone. Oftentimes, if a child can't be understood, it results in considerable amounts of frustration. So the earlier we intervene, if a child can't make him or her or they self understood, the better it is. So I just wanted to take one more minute to go back to this idea about phonological awareness. So that's the big umbrella. This is the, the big idea. The, the, that's the aim. That's the aim. That's where we're aiming for so that all youngsters will have well developed phonological awareness. They, most kids don't come to kindergarten with that well-developed. They come somewhere along the way. And then in kindergarten, in grade one, in grade two, they continue to develop those skills and they continue to be able to do the, the individual skills. And so then the, the colored sections of the umbrella represent those individual skills that your youngster uh, must master to read fluently. Now, it doesn't mean that children, let's say that, it doesn't mean that kids can't read if they don't master all of them. It generally does mean though that the kid is going to be they'll be struggle if they don't get pretty darn good at each of those sub skills. Are there any questions? Christine? Sandra, I just wanted to ask, and you, you just touched on this a little bit at the very end, but if a child doesn't have all of those skills that you just talked about, is there a way for a parent, caregiver, or teacher to determine which one of those skills they might be lacking? That's a very good question. And the very good answer is, not only is there a way, but it's paramount that the teacher knows how to do that. And oftentimes, unfortunately, they don't. And the reason it's paramount, Christine, is because we don't want to throw, a throw is a poor choice of words. We don't want to introduce remediation that's not targeted at the weaknesses. We want to target the remediation so that it's strengthening the weaknesses. If a youngster um, has the subskill of segmentation, then I don't need to remediate that. The child has it in place. So there are a series of, of assessment tools that 
can be used to discern what the child does well. We need to know what the youngster's doing well because we can build on that and we can use that to help with other things. But we also need to know what the youngster's struggling with so that the appropriate remediation can be implemented. The, the time that the teacher is going to have needs to is small. Even if they're doing small pullout, the, time, the minutes they have to work one-on-one -on -one or to work in small group, they're not many. It, it, you know, if a youngster gets two times a week in a pullout group with the teacher at, at a U table, it would be super beneficial to that youngster and the other children who are at that pullout if whatever remediation the teacher was instructing, all the children there needed that particular remediation. Did I answer your question, Christine? Yes, thank you. Okay. May we please have the next slide? So I like this slide because we move from the umbrella to this braided, braided, I don't know, fabric cord. And what's really powerful about this is, again, parents, guardians, teachers, get this understanding of this idea, <clears throat> excuse me, of threading together a number of subskills as we move towards fluent reading. So on the right there, as it's all braided together, you have a youngster who's now able to fluently read and by pulling together all of those subskills. So <clears throat> we have um, funds of knowledge or background knowledge or schema, all the stuff the youngster brings to it. You know, when you're taking your child to the zoo and you're taking your child to a baseball game, or maybe not in COVID, but you're taking your child out for a walk and you're pointing out birds and grass and gutters and a new truck and anything that you see, birds chirping, all that is background knowledge. All that is a skill. If you follow that chord on that first part there where it says background knowledge, that gets threaded into skilled reading. That, that pushing of that vocabulary, the last time we met, we talked about bathing a youngster in vocabulary. As much as the child will tolerate, uh, slowly and with precision. If you know that you're a fast talker, when your youngster is learning, if you can, when you can think about it, you want to slow that right down. The, otherwise, we get children saying LMNOP, thinking that's one block of, of meaning. We want to try to speak clearly and accurately. We want to be models of the English language, or if you're speaking in another language, to try to avoid slang. We want to model what we hope our children are going to be able to do and to understand. There's also a lot of um, metaphoric language. There's a lot of inference. If a child sees a character in a book and the character has a smile from ear to ear, we could say to the youngster, why do you think the child is feeling that way? What do you think happened? Or what might happen next that the youngster is so excited about? All of these things are part of learning to read. Then we have literacy knowledge. Um, that's just knowing that a book is something the youngster values. A book carries meaning. A book means when the child is presented with the book, the youngster, the images that come to mind, the youngster has a sense of sitting down on a couch, on the floor with somebody who cares about the youngster and, and it's gonna be a good time. And that pages move, uh, we, which direction the pages go, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes picture on top, words on the bottom. All of this knowledge, we're threading it into this youngster becoming a fluent leader. Then we have phonological awareness, which we just talked about, that gigantic umbrella overarching. Then we have this idea about decoding. And youngsters in grade one, when I instructed grade one, really liked this because it was the idea of we were breaking the code. And that's essentially what youngsters are doing. They're breaking the code, the alphabetic principle that this graphene, this syllable represents g. And if I put, or this one represents k. And when I, when I put k at together, because words are sounds pushed together, I can read that. And all that reading that we do with youngsters before they start to figure out the code, 
they know that words carry meaning. Children are interested in breaking the code. If they've had a lot of experience being read to, they're interested in, in, in breaking the code. They want to be detectives. That's the word I use. We're gonna be detectives and we're gonna break the code. And then you also have um, sight word recognition. So for example, youngsters come to school and almost regardless of what their name is, they have what's called automaticity with words like their name. Um, and then there are, even though that the English language is decodable, there are a number of words, usually the ones that come to us, the oldest words that come to us, for example, the word once. There's nothing that I can teach a youngster about the word once that that kid, that will help that kid to spell that word, O-N-C-E. Nothing I can instruct that kid other than it, what we call it a red word or a naughty word. And I put them on flashcards and I make them sight words. For me, sight words are words that the youngster can't decode. Oftentimes you'll see sight words as high frequency words. Not the same thing. My understanding of sight words are these are words that no matter what you instruct the youngster, was, um, the, all of these are sight words and the, and the child simply memorizes them. Um, because quite early in grade one, they will have a lot of youngsters who want to write stories about once upon a time. And so we just made a list of red words and, and the child had a little personal dictionary and they could just go there and get it. So this idea comes from Scarborough et al. in 2002. And I like it because it helps us to understand that this is not a simple task and that there's lots of room for families to positively influence this. All the, all the stuff on the top can all be heavily shaped by the reading experiences that a youngster has at home. Are there any questions? It's so much better when you ask questions because then I just feel like I'm not talking into a big void. So Sandra, um, one of the things that comes up quite a bit uh, when we're speaking to parents, when we're looking at sight words or high frequency words are these vocabulary lists or the spelling tests in school. So when, when parents and caregivers are talking to those teachers about the spelling lists or vocabulary lists, would you recommend that at early ages, the kids should still be tested on these, these sight words? Or is it more important to focus on the decodable words or those words that you could sound out? I think if we did national research, and I'm going to having a sabbatical soon, so this is another one that I've been thinking about. That nationwide to do a nationwide survey that counted the number of tears, uh, the number of arguments, the number of frustrations, the number of avoidance tactics, the number of times a youngster went to bed frustrated or parents and guardian caregiver frustrated around spelling lists, I think we would stop doing it. Oftentimes, teachers, well intentioned teachers, give children spelling lists that are maybe related to units of study that they're doing, but the youngsters have no ability to decode the words or use what they've learned so far to spell the words. And while I understand why that's done, if I was in charge of spelling, I would, that not, that's not how we would proceed. We would proceed with the words that youngsters can decode. And then you might want to have a few challenge words through the week for others, or you might have a couple of different spelling lists, depending on where the youngsters are, depending on what the individual needs are. Just like I pull different groups of children up to the table for small group instruction, the idea that one spelling list meets the needs of every youngsters in, youngster in those early in elementary classrooms is nonsensical to me. And, and I've just had so many families share terrible frustration with trying to get the youngster to memorize the list, list. And then the child goes to school. It's usually Friday morning. The child writes the test, maybe gets six out of 10 after there's been so much frustration. 
And then by Monday, the youngster can't remember a single word. So I don't know what the inherent value of it is. Thank you. If I was in charge of spelling nationally, oh my goodness, I'm probably going to get in trouble for this. I would stop that practice, Christine, in all honesty. And if I, if a parent, I, lots of parents and guardians spoke to me in the past, and I would say, if the youngster was very frustrated, I simply would say to the, I would, I would encourage the parent or guardian to say to the teacher, my child will not be participating in this spelling word list. Please provide another decodable list and we will work with our youngster on that list. Thank you. Now I do have one question here and I know you're going to be talking about this a little bit as we, as we go on, um, but you might wanna to touch on some of the things that you, you spoke about in your last uh, webinar and I know you've got an upcoming webinar, but the question here is, are there specific activities families can do over the summer to work on these specific skills? Yes, and I'm gonna show you some in just one more slide. I have a couple of books here and I have my whiteboard and we've got this new tiny bit of technology and I'm pretty excited about it. So the answer is unequivocally yes. I just have a couple more slides and then, and then I'm going to show you. So thank you for asking that. So Christine, would we please, could you please flip to the next card in the deck? So reading aloud, why is it a game changer? Supports vocabulary, especially when we know if you have an older child, a kid in grade three or grade four, who's not reading at grade level, their peers, their, read, their fluently reading peers are picking up a lot of vocabulary through what they're reading. You have to try to keep up with them if we wanna keep developing vocabulary. So reading aloud helps kids do that, helps continue to develop that vocabulary. When they're very young, it's just another way to introduce new vocabulary because oftentimes the words we find in books are not necessarily the words of day-to-day -day interaction with the youngsters. So it's a great place to build vocabulary. It helps youngsters see the connection between speaking and writing and between reading and writing. Most importantly, if I had to pick one thing about this reading aloud, it can be incredibly fun. And it makes the youngster, has the potential to make the youngster wanting to figure out this decoding process. When it's not fun, stop. It develops attention span. And it's very, it's a different kind of attention span than front, sitting in front of a TV. It's a different kind of attention span than video games because reading, generally speaking, the events are a little slower to unfold. It encourages listening and concentration and wonder and engagement. And if you do some of the activities that I'm gonna show you in just a minute, to get the youngster thinking. Is, as we mentioned earlier, quality literature and the books I'm gonna show you today, I would say that they fall into the quality literature category. They help introduce um, sophisticated language and that helps kids develop their thinking skills. It also helps, the, second, the third book I have, it helps with, the visual discrimination. So if we think of language arts, they're not just reading, but we have reading, writing, speaking, listening, viewing, and representing. And so if you pick high quality literature that's well illustrated, you help the youngster with viewing and representing as well. Another super important one in this incredibly complex world that we live in, particularly this past year, um, it provides a safe space as long as it's safe for children to explore emotions. And which four-year-old do you know that doesn't have big emotions? There's a safe place, they're cuddled up with somebody who cares about them and it gives them a chance to explore emotions, feelings, and increasingly in this complex world, differences in a safe space. As a high, former high school English language arts teacher, creating a classroom where differences could be explored safely was always one of my primary goals. It promotes emotional bonding with the reader, strengthens the relationships, develops social skills. The youngster learns to wait, learns, learns to ask questions, learns to communicate. If you do some of these things that I'm gonna suggest. Uh, next slide, please, or any questions, I, good. Okay, 
So what I want you to do first is just to look at that blue triangle and which is surrounded by a, sorry, it's not a blue triangle, it's a blue rectangle with the triangle in the middle. And if you see on the bottom, this is, these are skills that are getting increasingly complex. And so starting on the bottom, it's just the ability to hear rhyme and alliteration. Alliteration is like Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. And rhyme is all the Dr. Seuss books are, are rhyming books. Um, hearing words and spoken sentences. So that's telling us that the child understands that, a, that, that sentences are made up of words. Yes, that it's not just one string of sound, but they're individual words that are put together in a sentence. Hearing onset and rhyme. So onset is, so if the word is splash, the child can hear spool and hearing splat, hearing rhyme is splat, hearing all of that. And then the top of the heap is then the child being able to go sp, ooh, ah, sh. All of these things youngsters need to do to become um, fluent readers. Okay, Christine, do you think you could flip over so I can show some of these, unless there's a question, I could show some of these activities. No, no questions. So let's see if we can make our technology work here. I believe in you. <laughs> oh, is it working? Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so okay. hopefully we are seeing your, your book. Yes, well, I can see it. So I hope the participants can see it. So this is a book called Sheep in a Jeep by Nancy Shaw. It's very silly. It's very, there's a few words. There's not lots and lots and lots of words. It's fun. And I'm going to demonstrate a couple of the activities that um, could be done when reading this book. So I've got them all written down on big stickies. So let me just move. Um, the first thing here on the front would be, oh, it's a little slow. I would just invite the child um, to look at the picture um, make a prediction. And even with the two and three year old, I would be using that word prediction. What do you predict the story is going to be, out, be about? Look carefully at the wheels. Are all the wheels on the ground? Are all the sheep in the Jeep? Um, what kind of faces do the Jeeps have? Why do some look like they're scared and some look like they're laughing? All these introductory questions, what we're trying to do is get the youngsters funds of knowledge, their schema, their background knowledge. We're trying to get them all that. We're trying to activate it. We're trying to bring them into the story. If they were ever, maybe they have, um, maybe the child's four and they have one of those, you know, those sit upon electric cars and they've cranked it up on the side and, and you can try, oh, that looks like when you're riding your little car and you, you turn um, quickly and it pops up on the wheel. So you're trying to draw the child into the story. So let me just read. Oops, so it's a little slow, all the way from Cape Breton. Sheep in a Jeep. And if I was reading this, I would be very, I would probably do my, my talking exercises first and I would get my mouth ready to go and I would really enunciate. Okay, so I'm just gonna read a couple of pages and I'm gonna show you. Beep. Beep. Sheep in a Jeep on a hill that's steep. Depending on the age of your child, this could be a page to count the words. The thing about some of these activities that I just want to say before we get too deep into this, you don't want to stop on every page. In fact, my recommendation would be read through first just for the joy of it just for the youngster to hear the words, um, to swim around in the words before you start doing this type of in interruption. Uh-oh, the Jeep won't go. Sheep leap to push the Jeep. Sheep shove, sheep grunt, sheep don't think to look up front. Jeep goes splash, Jeep goes thud, Jeep goes deep in gooey mud. 
this language is delicious, absolutely delicious. So let's say you had, and, and young children are known for this. They're gonna want to hear this a hundred times. Some of you probably know, they, they come to memorize it and, and they'll call it reading and that's perfectly okay. So let's say you had read this 10 times and you're on this page and it says, Jeep goes splash, Jeep goes thud, Jeep goes deep in gooey paper. And then I would turn the page and the youngster would say, what, what, wait, 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 wait. And what you're hoping for is that youngster hears the substitution you've made. And so they're listening critically. They're expecting to hear mud and you say paper. And that tells you that the youngster's able to hear. They're able to hear that you made a mistake. That's, that's oral discrimination. That's one of the skills in Scarborough's role. That's one of the skills we wanna hear. The other thing that you can do is Jeep goes splash, Jeep goes thud, Jeep goes deep in gooey pud. Now it still rhymes. It's not the right word, but we wanna hear if the youngster is able to hear that. Okay, where's my list here? So rhyming words, um, counting words in a sentence. Um, we've seen a lot of words here that are, could be unfamiliar to the youngster. Where's that page? Um, so, um, for example, cheap. Here, I have a list of words here that might be unfamiliar to your youngster. Cheap, steer, steep, leap. This is a chance to, not on the first read, not on the second read, but to ask the child, well, what do you think that means? And if they don't know, just tell them. And it's not a test, you're just telling them. And I would pick one or two words. And then in the couple of days that follow, um, I might use that word. Like let's say, for example, you use leap. And then the next day you're out walking with the youngster. Oh, let's leap over the puddle. Let's leap out of the car. Well, we don't, well, that's probably not right, but let's leap onto the grass. And to, so you're trying to give context to the word outside of the book. Another thing that you can do with youngsters, let me just move this over. I had this all ready to go. And this can be done with in a couple of different ways. I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? Yeah. So this was, this is called Alconin boxes. And they were invented by a Russian psychologist. So what we do is put something, some sort of counter down um, on each of the spaces like that. And then we show the youngster, I have one here. We show the youngster a picture. So the child sees that. And what we want the youngster to do, so there's no letters yet. This could be still for, you know, kids who are pre-readers, a four-year-old. Um, what we want the child to do is each to put their thumb up and every time they hear a sound, push a counter. So we want the child to go, shh, e, And then we say, oh, so how many sounds in the word sheep? And hopefully the child's gonna go one, two, three. And that's correct. There are three sounds in that word. If you have an older child, where's my pen? What you can do, you can do it with the younger one too, but so you would go like this. Let me just get this on here. Excuse me, I'm gonna pull these back, pull the counters back. Can you see that? So I'm gonna have the child do the same thing. Shh, push a counter. E, push a counter, push a counter. Now let's say the child is in grade three and I'm gonna say, oh, you said three. Why are there more than three letters? So then we get a chance to talk about this, this, and the P. And that's an entirely different conversation. So S and H, when they push together, that's shh, they make one sound. E, E, that's a vowel team. So it says E, and then shh, E, 
that would be for a kid who's a little bit older. But for a youngster who's not decoding yet, you can just push the sounds. Shh, e, and it can be done with any word. Okay, so um, the other thing that I wanted to show you uh, around um, rhyming words before we move on to a book that maybe is for slightly older children is an activity that I like to do with kids is to put um, pictures on a card. And so these would be sheep and weep and, and we would talk about it and uh, jeep and then get this idea of what does it mean to rhyme, invite the child to think about other words that have that eep sound and then to in, into the deck there, um, let's um, introduce one that doesn't rhyme and see if the child, so we have sheep and jeep and I'm gonna say four words and you, and you put your hand up when you hear one that doesn't rhyme or you touch the picture that doesn't rhyme. Weep, sheep, bus, jeep. And hopefully the youngster's hand will go up. Uh, apple is another, I mean, just anything that doesn't fit the pattern. And then you can keep adding words in to fit the pattern. So that's something that a child can do uh, who's, a non, who's not reading yet. You can also put the, write the words on for youngsters who are a little bit older. It can also be an activity to introduce the different types of long E sound. So in Jeep, we get EE -E, um, and um, other words that I wrote down, but now of course I can't find it. Uh, we get EA sound. Um, so that's another activity that can be done with kids. Okay. Are there any questions? So let's have a look. Sorry, go ahead. I do have a question. Um, and it's, it's something that I've heard from other parents and actually something that I experienced myself as, as we were uh, helping our daughter uh, with her reading. And you mentioned that, you know, young children especially will like to hear stories over and over and over again. And um, they will often memorize the words or memorize the next lines. Um, and you had said that that is okay. Now, one of the things that we ran into is we had assumed as our daughter was, was starting to read that she was actually reading. And it was only later on we realized she wasn't learning how to read. She had just memorized books. So as a parent, how do you balance that? So that's a really good question. And one way to do that then with youngsters, if you have a sense of that, a little hint of that, or if you want to check, if you know there's a genetic predisposition for uh, dyslexia, then would just be to take a sentence, like sentence strip. So for example, um, yesterday we went to the beach and, and read that to the child a couple of times. So provide the child the opportunity to memorize it. We went to the beach and went for a swim. And then take the sentence strip, Christine, and cut it apart and see if the youngster can put it back together. See if the youngster can read the words in isolation, um, or is it, just, is it just that memory work? Is it visual memory? Another type of pattern that presents is students with very strong visual memories. This can be a presentation of dyslexia. Kids tend to be really good artists, the kids who present this way. So they visually memorize words as whole. So yesterday is not three syllables, it's just this thing called yesterday. I, I can remember once working with a child and the word was transportation. And I said, well, let's look at the word parts and I'm going, doing all this good Orton Gillingham stuff. And he says, just a minute. And he closed his eyes and he thought, and he said, and he pulled it out of visual memory, transportation, no decoding. It was a visual memory for the youngster. So by putting words in sentences, cutting the sentence into strip, into words, inviting the youngster to put it back together, looking at the words individually and seeing if the child can um, read them. Introducing nonsense words is another way. So um, um, badminton, um, if you just, if you put, cut that into three syllables and on, on one card and then cut it into three bits. And, and so it says badminton, mix it up and see if the youngster can put the bits back into the hole is another way. Uh, and again, nonsense words. So um, 
for example, we'll take the word flush. What's a nonsense word that, I don't know, what's a word that rhymes with flush, but mush, pu push. Push is not, oh yes, it's push. Um, I don't know. So just something that's not really a word, but at grade one, you know, the child should be able to decode it. So, um, and if the child, G-L-A-T, glat, it's not really a word, but if the child looks at that and has no sense of what that is, then that's a little concerning. Does that thank make you. sense, Christine? Yes, thank you. Yep. Do you, th yep. Do you think we could go back? Um, it it's okay, we'll just go here. So now I, I wanted to take a look at um, a book that might be appropriate, that is appropriate for slightly older children. Not that beep beep is not appropriate, but, um, uh, oops, something happened there. The host has spotlighted your video for everyone. Would you like to join? Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, so this is a beautiful book written by a Canadian um, called An Armadillo in Paris. Oh, we've frozen again. Oh, there it is. This is a beautiful book, a stunning book. And when we again think about the six arts of English language arts, if you have a child who's a good little drawer or a good little creator, there's so many places to talk about interesting things that relate to the creation of art in this book. And it's a powerful read aloud. It also has two voices in it, which I like. You get the voices of the, the grandfather, Armadillo, who wrote a travelogue when he visited Paris. And the, the grandson, Arlo, finds his grandfather's travelogue and sets out to Paris to view some of these places. And he really goes in, in search of the Iron Lady that his grandfather referred to. So let me just show you a couple of the pages. Um, I'm hoping it's gonna turn. So here you see the beautiful use, limited use of color and um, uh, black and white, little, just little touches of art here. And you get perspective on this page also. I should stop moving my hands because it takes a while, um, but let's go inside. Uh, footprints, so Arlo feels it the twitch in his left claw, the twitch that only stops when adventure begins. And to read with that sort of suspenseful voice, again, is invitational and part of that relational piece we're trying to do with kids. So here we see, this is, this is to imitate the page out of a journal that the grandfather wrote, Dearest Arnold, Arlo, Paris is one of my favorite cities. I can't wait for you to explore the beautiful place overflowing with art, history, and life. You'll love it as much as I do, especially my most favorite, favorite thing in Paris, the Iron Lady. Follow the path I've laid out in this journal and you will learn all about her and even get to meet her. Bon voyage, Arlo. This book is so great because it sets the youngster on a voyage. It sets the youngster on a journey. Where do we think that he's going are some questions. Have you ever gone on a journey? Do you like going on journeys? Do you like to be surprised? And again, look at that. Uh, it's just stunning. It's just gorgeous. And on the other page, which you can't see, now we're gonna get text from the grandfather's journal and we get text from, our, from, from Arlo's uh, journey. Lots of things that could be explored here um, are the grandfather's travel journals, the clues that he leaves for his grandson, the, the elegant lines, the, the, the muted palette of red and blue. Let me show you another page. Um, um, I love this one. It, I don't know if you, I don't know how I could do that. I don't know. I can't show you that one. It, hang on. Maybe if I go like this, this is just so gorgeous. It's him on the Champs Elysees looking at this beautiful fashion and in the dress is actually the, the statue that he's looking for. It's just stunning. 
Um, so family, uh, themes of family can, can be explored here. Aerial perspectives can be explored here. What is an armadillo? Um, who is the Iron Lady? These are some questions that you could ask when you're, when you're reading with an older child. There's beautiful vocabulary in here. Uh, macaroons in a shop window. Um, I just wanted to show you. He goes into a museum and he sees some illustrations at the museum. He explores the room filled with historic art, even the famous Mona Lisa. The 1889 World Fair posters and photographs show a very different time. So I, I'm suggesting this book and, and questions that go with it. This would be a book that I, I probably would stop multiple times. I would invite the youngster into the conversation. I would really try to help the youngster find links between his or her or their own life and, and what's happening here, again, around family, around culture around travel, uh, if particularly a kid who's, who we know is not reading at grade level. This is just a, a stunning book to help with that vocabulary piece, to help with the thinking piece, um, to also we want to help sustain the youngster's love of reading. This is a beautiful book to do that. Um, Christine, could you uh, pop the slide back up, do you think? Yes, I can. Are there any questions? And the next one, please. So these are a list of questions that you can ask your youngster. You know, if, how would you change the ending? Does it, does it feel like any other book we've read before? If you were gonna change the ending, how would you change it? Um, if you are gonna make a movie, um, maybe not this one because it's an armadillo, but if that's a question you can ask. Um, if you were the character, would you have done something differently? All these kinds of rich questions um, that help develop vocabulary, that help develop thinking, that help develop logic, because you're constantly coming back to, ask the question why. Um, and and then, the, then the child gets given the opportunity to think and to share their thinking. And can you push to the next one? Christine, please. And then again, I love this first one. If you, if you go in and you find your youngsters reading, um, this idea of encouraging the youngster to retell. Oh, I see you're already into it a little bit. Can you catch me up on the story? What happened so far? And that idea of retelling is really important. Um, stopping, what do you think will happen next and why? Coming back to that why question. Um, asking the child to, to either through their own art or through words, what do you think it would look like if you were on the Champs-Elysees, if you were in one of those shops that sell, sold croissants, can you draw me a picture? Can you illustrate it? Again, this constant bathing in thinking and words and language because it's not uncommon for a child with dyslexia when they when the school division gets around to testing the child they don't stop the test when the child is no longer able to decode and get the answers right they do stop there they don't put text in front of a kid they can't read but they will also the tester will keep reading to the child so let's say your youngsters in third grade and they can only decode at a first grade level the testing will also include the tester continues to read to the child and ask questions until the child can no longer answer. So if you have a third grade kid who's had a lot of experiences, rich language experiences, lots of being read aloud to, lots of being taken places and talked to and talked with, they'll often, the tester will often be at a grade seven or eight level and the youngster still able to answer the question the questions being asked. And so what that tells us is we're dealing with a bright youngster here. So what is getting in the way of this child whose comprehension is really strong? Why, why is the child comprehending at a grade eight level and only able to decode 
at a first grade level. That's often one of the things that they look at to try to explain that uh, with some of the other sub, sub skills that they give the youngster. So the richer and more developed you can help your youngster get with this piece of the comprehension and the vocabulary, the better off the youngster is. And I think the final slide, Christine, or that is the final slide. Yep, this is just other questions you can ask the child. Um, we talked about some of these. Th this idea of the story having a problem is often good language to use with a youngster. Not all stories have problems, but many of them do. What was the problem and how did the character solve the problem? And it's really helpful because then when kids are asked to write stories, sometimes kids will just say, I got up in the morning, we went to the beach and we came home. Well, there's no problem there. Got up in the morning, went to the beach and we forgot our lunches. And now we have a problem. Now there's something that the characters can do. So that's an idea that we want to introduce as early as we can, this idea of there being a problem and the character solving the problem. And finally, the last slide, or was that the last one? Oh, that's it. Uh, are there any questions? I have one, I think, and I'm just noticing the time. We're right at the end, but I have one question that comes up time and time again, and I know you have very strong opinions about this one, but can a, a parent, caregiver, or teacher read books in multiple languages? Is that okay to mix up, or not to mix up languages, to, but to read one book that's in English and one book that might be in French and one book that might be in, in another um, language that's spoken at home? So I'm really glad that you asked this because I get asked it all the time. And oftentimes the school will say, okay, your child's struggling in English. Let's just focus on English and stop speaking or reading in other languages. And that's really not in anyone's best interest because language is not neutral. Language carries meaning, language carries cultural knowledge, language carries worldviews. And if you at home are speaking Urdu or Gujarati or French or Hebrew or some other language, you are transmitting culture to your youngster. You're transmitting worldviews. You're allowing that youngster, if the youngster has family in other parts of the world, you're allowing that youngster a bridge to the, the family members who might not speak English. And you're developing, you're building the child's funds of knowledge, their background schema. Sometimes youngsters who do have more than one language on the go are a little bit, uh, take a little while longer to, do, to, to break the code. But generally speaking, if there's not a learning disability, they, they get it. So the answer is read to your youngster uh, in your first language, help them to get that first language. If the school says, stop doing it, say no, thank you. Because we know that it's so important to the youngsters' um, well-being and a cultural identity also. I was reading an article the other day, cultural identity helps stave off some of the mental health challenges our kids uh, might be having. If they know they feel they belong, um, that's part of cultural identity. So we don't want to just focus in on English. Absolutely not. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandra. And thank you for that answer. Just like you, we get asked it all the time. And um, we, we hear stories from parents, um, you know, on a weekly basis being told that they should just focus on one language. And we know it's so beneficial for so many reasons to, to speak to your children in, in as many languages as you can, to read to them in as many languages as you can. So thank you very much for that. And I would also like to thank you, Sandra, for putting this program together for us. It was our first time trying out a new piece of technology. I think it worked pretty good for our first go at it and definitely something we will keep trying. And for those who are listening today and joining us today, thank you so much for, for participating. And Rob, thank you for your assistance in the background. So once again, thank you everyone for joining us. If you would like to learn more about Dyslexia Canada or dyslexia, please go to our website at dyslexiacanada.org and sign up for a newsletter while you're there where we will um, provide you with upcoming events, with new ideas, new research and information. 
So thank you very much, everyone. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event or webinar. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Jillian. Thank <laughs>